In this video, we're going to learn about the third law of thermodynamics. All right, in our studies of uh, entropy, uh, we've been uh, looking at how to calculate the change in entropy for a chemical reaction. And what we have is that for a chemical reaction where reagents go to products, you can, in principle, uh, set, set up the calculation as simply the difference in a measure of entropy in products minus uh, uh, the same measure of entropy in reagents. The question is, how do we get those measures of entropies, right? So we said that in the case of uh, entropies, you can actually uh, determine what is the absolute molar entropy uh, of a substance. That's something that was not possible with the enthalpies, uh, and then we had to use an alternative relative scale of enthalpies called the enthalpies of formation. But for entropies, we actually can uh, use absolute molar entropies, uh, and that's because uh, the third law of thermodynamics uh, gives us a way to determine those absolute molar entropies. Okay, so what is the third law of thermodynamics? Well, remember that uh, entropy is a measure for how uh, matter and energy are dispersed. Okay, so uh, then what you can uh, begin to think is, well, can't you imagine of an idealized situation in which there's no matter or, this, or, or, this, uh, or energy dispersion at all? Uh, uh, if there's no matter or energy dispersion at all in a particular system, then you can say that, well, that would mean that the entropy is zero, right? So the question is, can we actually think of a set of conditions or a set of materials uh, which are perfectly ordered, right, so no dispersal of matter, and then uh, that have no dispersal of, of uh, energy, and that would mean that the temperature is zero Kelvin, and if both of those conditions apply, then you would say, well, the entropy for those uh, substances should be zero. Okay, so that's actually what the, uh, the third law of thermodynamics is. It tells you that for a perfectly crystalline surface that is uh, uh, pure, okay, let me repeat, repeat that, for a, a perfectly crystalline substance that is pure, okay, so let's take water being pure and then being a crystal, so we'll be, we'll be looking at ice, and then uh, if you're at zero Kelvin, okay, so for a perfectly crystalline substance at zero Kelvin, there's no matter dispersal or energy dispersal, so the entropy should be zero. And again, that's, that's the third law. It's very simple. Right? So the more entropy for any substance that is perfectly uh, pure and crystalline at zero Kelvin is equal to zero. Okay, so this would not apply to things that are mixtures. This would not apply to things that are amorphous, right? So they don't have uh, uh, perfect crystals. But if you have a perfectly crystalline surface and you're at zero Kelvin, then the absolute more entropy will be zero uh, joules per mole per Kelvin. Okay? All right, so great, that's the third law of thermodynamics, but that's still not helping us uh, answer the question of, well, how do we uh, calculate absolute more entropies for substances at conditions that we're interested in? Right? So generally, in chemistry, we're interested in 298 Kelvin. Okay, on 298 Kelvin, then, then you don't have uh, this, this uh, circumstance. However, if you stop to think about, if you start to think about this, then the idea here is that uh, this provides a foundation over which to obtain the absolute molar entropies at the temperature uh, conditions that you want. Okay, because notice that uh, if you think about, uh, say, water, by uh, 298 Kelvin and one bar of pressure, okay, water uh, is liquid. Right, so uh, the idea is how do we go from uh, water being a perfectly uh, a crystalline uh, uh, substance at zero Kelvin to liquid water at 298 Kelvin? Well, you can actually see that that, that uh, transformation is not difficult. What you have to do is heat that ice, that solid, from zero Kelvin until it's melting uh, temperature, then melt it, melt it from uh, uh, the solid to the liquid at whatever uh, temperature that, that uh, uh, transition takes place, and then simply heat the remaining liquid until 298 Kelvin. Right? If you're able to compute what the change in entropy in all of those steps is uh, from zero to 298 Kelvin, then you actually can calculate what the absolute molar entropy is uh, for that water at 298 Kelvin. Okay, so we're gonna go slow, and we're gonna show how this works for a different substance that is not water, but for, for example, for uh, oxygen. Okay, so uh, let's think about the case of oxygen. All right, so we're going to do this graphically so that you guys can see how this works. Okay, so here's going to be uh, the molar entropy, and we're going to be working at standard conditions. So uh, that means that the pressure is going to be one bar. And we're going to have uh, pure substances, or uh, pure, pure oxygen. Okay, so this is going to be temperature. 
And again, notice that the thermal thermodynamics tells us that at zero Kelvin, which will be this point, zero Kelvin, uh, the entropy uh, should be zero uh, joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, and again, this is not our goal. Our goal is to actually get to 298 Kelvin, okay, at one bar, because that's where we uh, normally want to know how to compute uh, changes in entropy for chemical reactions. Okay, so our goal is to end up right here. Okay, when we end up right here, then what will happen is that, well, this is going to be the value of the molar entropy uh, that we're looking for at uh, 298 Kelvin. And this is what we really want to uh, uh, find out so that we can use it in, in calculations of changes in chemical, uh, in ch changes in entropy in chemical reactions. All right, so again, we start with uh, uh, oxygen being a solid, okay, at zero Kelvin, and the entropy is zero. That is the third law. And then what we actually know about oxygen is that uh, it undergoes uh, fusion or melting at 54 degrees, which I'm going to draw more or less around here, 54 uh, Kelvin. And then uh, it undergoes uh, vaporization, so the, the turning of liquid into the gas at about 90 Kelvin. So I'm going to uh, draw that right here. Okay, so then uh, the idea is that, well, uh, at zero Kelvin, okay, you're going to have solid oxygen. Okay, but then uh, the only thing that you have to do is simply heat that oxygen, okay, until it hits uh, 54 degrees. Okay, so this point is simply the heating of oxygen solid. Okay, and we actually know how to calculate uh, the change in entropy in heating. Uh, that, that is uh, something that we have seen, uh, have seen in other videos. Now, once you get to 54 degrees, that's where the phase transition takes place, right? So this is where solid oxygen turns into liquid oxygen. Now, that phase transition is isothermal and isobaric as well. And what that means is that, well, the entropy is going to increase because you're turning the solid into the liquid, but notice that it's going to increase uh, uh, with uh, this slope. Okay, there's no change in temperature. I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller. And that is simply the change uh, in entropy of fusion of uh, this oxygen. Okay, so at this point, now you have that you have heated uh, uh, that solid oxygen from zero to fifty-four Kelvin, and then you have uh, 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 undergo you have melted that uh, uh, solid oxygen into the liquid. Okay, so what happens next? Well, at this point, you have liquid oxygen. So what you have to do is simply uh, take that to the vaporization point, which will be right here. Okay, so that will be your vaporization point. That's the point at which, uh, at one bar, you turn from liquid oxygen to uh, gas oxygen, right? And again, this will be simply the heating of the liquid. So I'm going to draw here another arrow, and there is the heating of liquid oxygen. Okay. Right, so uh, we bring this to the vaporization point, and again, uh, now you have your vaporization, which is uh, also uh, uh, increases the entropy, right? It actually increases the entropy more than fusion, okay? Turning the solid into the liquid uh, increases the entropy less than turning the liquid into the gas. So this uh, increase that you see right here should be larger than that one. And that is simply the change uh, in entropy upon vaporization. That's something that we know how to calculate as well. And then, uh, you, you, you here you have at the end of the phase transition, you will have gas oxygen at 90 Kelvin, and the last thing that you need to do is simply elevate the temperature of that until 298 Kelvin, and the entropy should increase the, your, because you're heating this gas. Okay, so notice that uh, this would simply be the heating of O2 gas. Right, so there's five steps that uh, we actually have to uh, carry out in the case of oxygen to be able to determine the molar entropy at 298 Kelvin. We simply have to heat the solid from 0 Kelvin uh, to 54 Kelvin, and we know how to do that, right? So remember that uh, the way that we calculate changes in entropy upon heating is simply uh, this, the integral of the heat capacity over T differential of T. Okay, we're doing this at constant pressure at one bar, so that would be C sub P, which is that. We're also doing this on upper mole basis, so what that means is this, this will be uh, delta SM and this will be CPM. Okay, so that's uh, what happens, uh, what you have to use for this uh, step, which is the heating of solid oxygen from 0 Kelvin to 54 Kelvin. 54 Kelvin, phase transition, right? So the uh, change in entropy for a phase transition, uh, we know how that works. Okay, I'm going to uh, make this be sub T as, as in transition. 
And that is a simply uh, the uh, change in enthalpy in the transition molar and standard over the temperature of the transition T sub T. Okay, and uh, these transitions take place at equilibrium. Okay, so we actually have that that equation does apply. All right, so uh, you can use that ex expression with the change uh, in enthalpy for fusion of O2 to compute this uh, increase in entropy. Then you will have the liquid. This is another heating process. So you would now be using that expression. And the only thing that changes is that now you will have to use there the heat capacity of liquid oxygen. Well, you bring that liquid oxygen to 90 Kelvin. Now you have the vaporization phase transition, so you have to use this again. That's the fourth step. Okay, and now that would be the enthalpy of vaporization at the temperature of vaporization, which is 90 Kelvin uh, in this particular case. And after that, that, you simply have the gas, and you have to heat that to 298 Kelvin, so you're back at this equation, and that will be the uh, heat capacity of uh, oxygen gas. Okay, so five steps to be able to, uh, uh, starting from the third of thermodynamics, zero Kelvin, uh, that means that the entropy is zero, to 298 Kelvin uh, for oxygen gas, then you can use all of these calculations to, to come up with the, what the absolute more entropy for oxygen is. And th that number is actually known, and I'm gonna just write it uh, out here somewhere. Uh, I'm gonna write it and erase this. I write that for. I'm going to write here a table of uh, more entropies for uh, substances. Okay, uh, standard, and these are all going to be at 298 Kelvin. Okay, so for oxygen, which is a gas, that number happens to be 205.1, and the units are going to be joules per mole Kelvin. And again, we can do this for any substance. So suppose that now you're interested in liquid water. Okay, so you're trying to set up here a combustion where you, one of your reagents is oxygen and one of your products is liquid water if you're doing this at one bar and, and room temperature. Okay, so then you will also need what the value of H2O for liquid is. And, and again, while well, you have a diagram that is very similar to this, but notice that your end point would not be water gas, it would be water liquid. But still, you could, you could uh, do something similar to this to find that this number will be 69.9 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, unlike this, there's uh, extensive tables, and you will find one at the end of your book, uh, where you have absolute more entropies for all of the substances. Okay, so uh, notice how simple this is. From the thermal thermodynamics, now we have tables where you have the absolute molar entropies for any substance that you want, as long as it's pure, and it's this uh, values of the absolute molar entropies that we actually now can use uh, in, in to the calculation of the change in entropy in a chemical reaction. Before we wrap up this video, I want to draw your attention to a couple of details about these absolute more entropies. Notice that absolute more entropies will always be positive and greater than zero if you're working at 298 Kelvin. Okay, why is that? Well, because the lowest possible entropy that you can have is set by the third law of thermodynamics, and that is zero at zero Kelvin. If your temperature is higher than zero Kelvin, okay, then your entropies are always going to be larger than at zero Kelvin, that means that all of your uh, molar entropies will be positive. Okay, so that is imp uh, uh, an important uh, detail and is different from what we had with the uh, enthalpies of formation where some of those enthalpies would be negative, some of those uh, enthalpies are positive. Okay, so, so that's because the zero is arbitrarily said at the most stable allotropes of elements and some substances have more enthalpy than the elements, some uh, substances have less enthalpy than the elements, right? So you have enthalpies of formation that are positive or negative. In the case of molar entropies, they're all positive, okay? And uh, a second thing that I, uh, that I want to draw your attention to is uh, that for the most stable allotropes of elements like oxygen gas, these values won't be zero, right? So these numbers are very different uh, from the enthalpies of formation, okay? Because that's, that's because we're not putting the zero at the most stable allotropes of elements, we're putting the zero where the third law tells us to. Okay, so that is uh, another distinction. And finally, uh, uh, a third detail that I want to tell you about before wrapping up this video is that if you were now to compute what the uh, um, uh, enthalpy, so not enthalpy, entropy of water gas would be at 298 Kelvin, okay, so for the gas, not the liquid that we have right here, that number is going to be about 189 joules per mole Kelvin. So you can clearly see how gases are actually much more entropic uh, than liquids, and liquids are also more entropic than solids, okay, for the same substance. And that is something that bodes well for uh, our intuition of what entropy is, this dispersal of energy 
and matter, okay, so, so gases should be more entropic in the liquids than solids, and that is the, something that is borne out by these absolute moral entropies that you can calculate from the third law. Okay, so in summary, in this video we have introduced the third law of thermodynamics, and then we have used it to see how we can obtain uh, tables of absolute moral entropies at 298 Kelvin. Now, these absolute molar entropies at 298 Kelvin are going to be extremely useful for us to calculate changes in entropy in chemical reactions, and we're going to see an illustration of that in the next video.